Do you remember your sex education? Was it helpful to you? Was it filled with scientific information rather than real, practical advice? I'm Diggory Waite, and this is The Real Sex Education. Each week, I'll be joined by a guest. We'll impart our own sex wisdom, ask our own sex questions, and we'll go over all the things they don't teach you in school. To bring this all together, though, we'll need an expert. A sexpert, if you will. But the only sex and relationship therapist I know is my mum. Hello, mum. Hello, Diggs. In this episode, we're joined by Dr. Betty Martin to talk about consent. Consent may not be something that you give or get. It's something that you arrive at together. How it applies in and outside the bedroom. Will you scratch my back? Will you pick me up at the airport? Will you rub my feet? And we play the three minute game. The game is how do you want to touch me for three minutes? Well, hell yeah, I can think of some fun things to do there. Hello and welcome back to The Real Sex Education. I'm Digby Waite and as ever, I'm joined by accredited sex and relationship therapist, Kate Campbell. Hello, Mum. Hello, Diggs. Mum, it's Series 3, we're back. How exciting is that? About time too, isn't it, really? Yeah, we've been busy, you've been busy, I've been busy. Pandemic effect. Yeah, it certainly has. How was lockdown 3 for you? Oh, mm. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> was it, what changed? Why was lockdown 3 different? Was it perhaps the fact that I was back... Staying with you, maybe? <laughs> yeah, might have been a bit more of a struggle. But we, we have been busy. We've been working away on this new series of The Real Sex Education. Listeners of the first two series will notice a slight shift this series. In series one and two, students of the show listen to celebrities talking about their usually awful sex educations and their own sex lives. But now, congratulations class, you've graduated. It's series three. It's time to hear from experts. Do deep dives on specific subjects about sex and relationships and get you guys the sex education you deserve. To choose some of the topics this series, we've gone back and listened to old episodes and tried to find things that come up a lot but we haven't given that much airtime to. And today's episode is exactly that. It was something that came up almost every single episode of the first two series but we've never given it a full episode and today we can do that today we can talk about consent Mm. and who better to talk about it than dr betty martin the curator of the wheel of consent and the author of the book the art of receiving and giving mum dr betty martin Who is she in the sex therapy world? Everybody loves Betty Martin. She is pretty much a a go-to person when you want to discuss consent because she's given us such a wonderful structure for doing that. And Mm. her ideas you can use with all sorts of things, all sorts of kinds of consent, not just sexual consent. Although, obviously, that's what we're talking about. The great thing about Betty as well is that so many of her Uh, resources are online are all free yeah it's fantastic and there's lots of for me great video content as well that's uh, how I like to Mm. consume a lot of my stuff and and podcasts and things so and it's all free and so I remember it wasn't I I would rush downstairs I'd be like oh my I've just learned about the wheel of consent and I'm yeah and I'm obsessed with it it's great she's so generous she's such a generous person giving giving us all that all that stuff Oh my God, mm. absolutely. And she even says on her website, she's like, you know, my people tell me that I shouldn't be giving this away for free, but screw them, which I think is great. Um, mm. So stay tuned for that conversation because we speak to Betty about the wheel of consent, what it is, how it applies, not just to your sex life, like you said, mum, but everyday life. She also tells us how we can wake up our bodies to pleasure and how you can combine both principles with your partner by playing the three minute game. Um, but before we get to that, mum, as a sex therapist, is consent something that comes up a lot? As a therapist, in general, it comes up. I mean, one of the things that people don't realise is how often consent could be of use to them. So, um, and actually could could improve sexual frequency Mm. because an awful lot of people avoid any kind of touch because they're worried about where it's going to lead. Whereas if you had conversations that created boundaries and if you had had conversations which allowed both partners to feel comfortable with speaking about 
about what they actually wanted at that moment, then you would have be having a lot more sex because you wouldn't be not having it because you're worried about what's going to happen next. You wouldn't be avoiding touch in case it went any further. You'd both be able to say, oh, no, not tonight or not just now or give me five minutes or whatever. Mm. And, you know, I, I'm a great believer in planning. So if you if you plan something, then you don't have to worry about expectations you, mm. you know what to expect. I mean, you know, something spontaneous may happen, but people set great store by spontaneity. For some reason, they believe that sex should always just happen and it's going to be great and marvellous. And of course, that's not the case. You need, mm. it, it actually requires a lot more planning. And if people were to check in with themselves, they'd often find that they're not doing what they actually consent to. They're imposing upon themselves things that they feel they ought to be doing, things that they're trying to avoid or things that they don't want to do. Do you see what I mean? I mean, it's really, mm. really difficult. So it's actually mm. worth thinking about what you want and having proper conversations, which Betty gives us. She gives us a framework for those conversations, mm. which is absolutely wonderful. You can really, really decide what works for you. And you collaborate and you're not on opposite sides. I mean, you're going to, about to make love and you're on opposite sides mm. a lot of the time. That's how couples find themselves. They find themselves fighting. They find themselves in competition. They find themselves enemies over something which should be bringing them together, which should be beautiful and you know fun. But people think that it only applies to really, really serious breaches of consent. So we hear consent in relation to things like rape, mm. you know, Me Too, and, and, and times when people have not given consent to sexual touch. And actually, it's about so much more than that, so much more. And I think because it's been related to dramatic evils, if you like. People don't think it applies to them, but it applies to all of us so much. Mm. I, that was exactly what I was going to say next, because the consent conversation is a lot more prevalent at the moment because of Me Too really shining a spotlight on it. Mm. And in the wake of that, do you think that people understand consent very well? No. Do you think... Yeah. No, full stop, no. <laughs> because I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't understand it because, I mean, this is something I found fascinating. Joy Short, who talks a lot about this, said that in 2018 with the Bill Cosby case, it was one of the big cases mm. of the Me Too era, the juror's first question was, can we have a definition of consent? Mm. Because apparently in Pennsylvanian law, there was no definition. And the judge just replied and said, use your common sense. I mean, mm. there's a great definition from Planned Parenthood that I think is a good one to kick off with. We will also have one, uh, Betty also gives us one of hers, which I think is an even better one for her framework as well. Mm. But this is a good one to go with. And it's the acronym FRIES, like French fries. Uh, mm. The F being for freely given, um, mm. so, you know, a choice without pressure, manipulation or under the mm. influence of drug or alcohol. R is reversible. Mm. Anyone can change their mind. And that reminds me of what Ita O'Brien said to us about how consent is a process, not a moment. Mm. You know, it's mm. it's not it's not a question. You know, it can be reversed where you can say, oh, I, I'd like this. And then when you're not enjoying it, you're, I don't like that at all. Mm. And I think a lot of people skip over that in their definitions. Um, the next one, I informed. You can only consent to something if you have your full story. For example, if someone says they'll use a condom and then they don't, there isn't full consent, which mm. again actually reminds me of Ito O'Brien because there's that scene in I May Destroy You, Michaela Cole's TV show, where that happens. You know, that's not a consensual situation. And that sends Michaela Cole's character into, into a bit of a spiral and understandably so. Mm. E, enthusiastic. This is another one that so many of these definitions looks beyond. Enthusiastic. Mm. When it comes to sex, you should only do stuff that you want to do, yeah. not things that you feel you're expected to do, which again was what you were saying earlier, like mm. that's the sort of thing that people, lot of people do. And the last one, S, and this is another one that people look over a lot, and that's specific. Saying yes to one thing, like going to the bedroom to make out, doesn't mean you are said yes to other things like having sex. Mm. And that's one of the issues with these consent apps. So there's these apps, and these are genuine names of the apps. I consent, like iPod. Mm. You consent, we consent. Those are three different apps. And, you know, Basically, you like log into the app and connect with the other person. You're like, you both say, I consent to this. It's not legally binding. It overlooks so many of the things we were just mm. talking about there. Reversible, mm. specific. All those things are overlooked. Mm. That doesn't 
work. They don't work. No. And as you say, it's a process. It's an ongoing process. And, you know, it works in many ways. You might have somebody who is enjoying some a kind of touch, but wants more of something else or it's wet their appetite. I mean, you might be saying, we're only going to just touch outside clothes and we're not going to go any further. And mm. then they might actually think, oh, you know, I'm really enjoying this. I'd quite like to go a bit further. I mean, do this. Mm. I'd like you to do this or do that. Yeah. And, and, it's and, reversible and extendable. That, yeah, yeah. And you, or equally, you might just think, oh, I'm not feeling this. I want to go to sleep. Um, mm, you know, mm. e- that, it, either way, it should be possible without any awkwardness, without it being too difficult to 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 have that conversation or, or not even it's a few words isn't it yeah and, and an ongoing one it's almost as if it's sort of like let's have a conversation and just remain completely silent whilst we're having sex which just seems insane well, well you, you know well, you know when, when sometimes when couples come along and they say we're oh we're not having any sex and then i say okay let's impose a sex ban and they say well we're not having any sex anyway we say but when you have the sex ban you have to then discuss what is possible and then you say okay so we can hold hands we can kiss we can hug at night we can stroke one another's faces we can cuddle up on the sofa we can do all these things but no more Mm. well all of a sudden you're touching again Mm. All of a sudden, and you're discussing. You're discussing it. You've yeah. given, you found a way to discuss it. You're you're giving consent. You're you're actually finding ways to touch. And it's amazing how many people break the ban. Actually, having never had sex for twenty years, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is not to set up a trick. The purpose is to get them talking and to give that consent and to find ways of changing it when necessary and to see where it goes. And generally speaking, people say, "Oh my God, the difference it's made." Wow, I that I love that, but bloody hell, mum, save it because we're getting there. Yay! <laughs> um, but I think the last thing I'll say on this is is people might see the title of this episode and see you know consent, and they'll think, well, it's a really heavy topic that they're discussing, and it's really depressing, or they think, well, I'm not going to be raped, I'm not going to rape anyone, so this episode isn't for me. Mm. But listen, please, if you got this far, listen to what Betty Martin says. It is completely, like you said before, mum, it reframes the whole consent conversation. Mm. And I think what's so important is it reframes it in a way that, at least for me, it's not doom and gloom anymore. In fact, it's inspiring and exciting. Absolutely. Which is amazing. So let's waste... No more time. Let's talk about this very important topic with our very important guest, our VIP. Welcome, Dr. Betty Martin. Yay. I didn't know I was a VIP. Okay, coming up in the world. When we're talking about consent, there's no greater VIP than Dr. Betty Martin. There's nothing more important. But for people that don't know, maybe, can you tell people who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm a grandma. Mm. I'm uh, a cisgender white woman of age. I was a sex worker for a number of years. Well, before that, I was a chiropractor for about 30 years. So I had my hands on countless numbers of people. And before that, I was a hippie and I had my hands on a lot of people then too. (laughs) And then I had my own erotic kind of awakening and exploring that I did for my own self. And these days, I'm retired from that. I developed a practice called the Wheel of Consent. And these days... That's all I teach, and I travel around the world and teach that to sex workers, sex therapists, therapists, doctors, massage therapists, teachers, people who are in the helping other people business. Mm. So before we talk in a little bit more detail about the will of consent, which I'm so excited for because I love it, how do you define consent? That's a great question, and, and that's a question I often like to start with because a lot of people think consent means permission. If I want to get my hands on you, I need your permission, of course. But that's one kind of consent. But what if I say, will you rub my back? And you say, yes. Where does permission fit in that dynamic? It doesn't. It doesn't apply to that dynamic where you're doing something that I have asked you to do. Permission doesn't apply. But consent applies. So after I'd been teaching consent for 10 or 15 years, I decided I should look it up in the dictionary. So I did that. (laughs) And what I found was that it basically means agreeing to what someone else wants. So you consent to have something done to you or you consent to do something. And it basically means saying yes. 
But I don't think that's a big enough definition for the conversation that's happening these days around consent. I think of it more as an agreement. What are we agreeing together? And so consent may not be something that you give or get. It's something that you arrive at together. That's kind of an idealized version, I realize. But those conversations around consent that you mentioned, I mean, for some people, you're very much leading those with your work on things like the wheel of consent. So if we can, let's talk about that a bit more. Usually, though, the wheel of consent, obviously, it's a literal wheel. So there's obviously a a visual Mm -hmm. element to it. Is there a way that you can explain it without that for us and just some of the concepts behind it? Sure. The wheel of consent is about the difference between when I'm touching you for your enjoyment, I'm doing what you've asked me to do, scratching your back or whatever. That's one thing. And if I do to you for my enjoyment, maybe I'm feeling you up or playing with your hair or whatever. That's a different dynamic. And the wheel of consent is about noticing those two different dynamics. I'm doing what you want or I'm doing what I want. And likewise, you're doing to me what you want or you're doing to me what I want. What's the difference and why does it matter? Each of them are wonderful in different ways, and each of them are appropriate at different times. And what's fun about that, and what is there to be discovered about that? So in drawing the wheel, you end up with a circle which represents consent or agreement. Really, it should be the wheel of agreement, but it's too late to change the name. (laughs) And um, so you have a, a circle, and then you have a Uh, a line going up and down and a line going across and those two lines intersect and create four quadrants and if you divide the wheel in half you have the doing half where I'm doing I'm either doing what I want or I'm doing what you want or I'm done to you're either doing what you want or you're doing what I want and on side to side you have the receiving and giving halves if I'm giving I'm putting my desire aside, and I'm going with what you desire. So that may be that you desire me to do this thing to you, or it may be that you desire to do this thing to me. And either way, I have said yes. I said you can do this, but not this, or yes, I'll do this and not this. So I, I, my boundaries are still respected there, but I've said yes. And so I'm giving you a gift of what you want. And then the other side of the wheel is receiving which means it's about me. It's about what I want. I'm bringing my desires forward, and I'm hoping that you will set your desires aside and go with what I want. And so I'm asking you, may I play with your feet? May I fill you up? May I you know, borrow your truck? And you have said yes. Or I'm asking, will you? Will you scratch my back? Will you pick me up at the airport? Will you... Um, kiss my ear? Will you rub my feet? And you have said yes. And so on that side of the wheel, either of those dynamics, it's for me. It's all about me. I'm asking for what I want and you're giving it to me. So I think the wheel of consent is probably the only circle with four halves. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So let me understand if I've got this right. You have giving, which is uh, taking action for the benefit of someone else. Yes. Taking, which is taking action for your own benefit receiving which is benefiting from the action taken by others or another yes and allowing which is allowing others to benefit from taking action upon us Mm -hmm. and those are the four separate things that whenever we're having sex we fall into one of those quadrants one of those four things is that right yes yes although what you're calling receiving i call accepting because there's two kinds of gifts you can receive I can receive the gift of you doing something that I want, or I can receive the gift of being allowed to do what I want. Mm -hmm. And both of those are gifts to me. Mm. It's like you can bring me some pears from the tree in your yard and put them in a nice basket and put them on my porch, and I'm receiving this gift of pears. Or you could say, come on over and pick pears anytime you want. Now, I'm going over and picking the pears on your tree, it's the same pears, but I'm taking action to collect the gift. 
Mm-hmm. So it, it's a combination of it's for me and I'm taking action. And that's the one that tends to be most confusing for people. Because we're, when it comes to touch especially, we're so used to thinking of, okay, if I'm touching you, it's by definition for you. Or it mm-hmm. should be, at, at least. And so I have to do the right stroke to make you feel the right way because that's the right thing to do. But that's not always the case. Mm. It may be that I just want to get my hands on you. Mm. And so I just need to ask permission. Can I get my hands on you? Can I play with your feet? Can I play with your hair? There's also an enormous amount of response pressure created when one partner knows that the other one is trying to please them. Yes. And, oh, my uh, gosh. Know, and, and, and a lot of sex therapy begins with telling people that they are only allowed to touch for their own interest, uh-huh. whether it's it causes pleasure or not. But they're only allowed to do whatever they do is for their own interest and they don't need to think about the other person and they all agree to that uh, or they both agree to that and they're, they're doing it for their own and they, and they can't ask what it feels like and they can't talk about it uh-huh. and they just yeah. have to tolerate not knowing how it's going. And yeah. it's the hardest, hardest it's thing. Hard. And if you can crack that, you can crack everything. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That's the take allow dynamic. It makes a huge difference in the quality of your touch and the quality of your experience. Absolutely. And and people wouldn't think so. They think, oh, well, of course, of course it's not going to go anywhere because it's supposed to be about the other person right. all the time. And when people actually do it, then they're saying, this is amazing. Our sex yeah. lives are amazing. <laughs> yes, And exactly. suddenly... It, exactly. it's, it's so counterintuitive, but, yeah. you know, not yeah. when you think about it. Yeah. But that's so true about the response pressure as well, because like, obviously that's why people fake orgasms and stuff. Yeah. And it's yes. interesting because I think when you apply it back to the will of consent, you can ask couples where they think they are in the bedroom. Yeah. Like what quadrant they're in. Like, are they giving, taking, receiving or allowing or whatever? Yes. I think that right now, a lot of couples, if you were to ask them that, one of them will say, oh, I'm giving. I'm doing the thing. Yeah, I'm doing the thing that you want me to do. And the other one will go, oh, no, I was allowing you to do that to me because I thought you liked it. I thought that was for your benefit. And they're like, oh, no, I thought I was doing that for you. And I think people get into that trap because you want your partner to have fun. Their pleasure is often seen as more important than your own because you love them. Mm -hmm. You like them. That's why you're Mm -hmm. going out. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. So giving and allowing with your partner in a sort of sexual context is kind and generous and the obvious way to go of course mm-hmm. you want to do stuff for them whereas taking and receiving is seen as selfish you know we've all heard of people be like you know i spent a night the other day with a guy and he was just taking and being selfish <laughs> yeah. the whole time yeah. yeah and yeah that that is bad because yeah they're not taking it in turns and in that sense they are just being selfish whereas with the will of consent you can work out who is doing what who it's for you can then agree on what you want and what your partner wants and then you can take it in turns taking and receiving. And then you can also take it in turns giving and allowing. And then everyone's happy. Yeah, that's really true. But can you expand on that a little bit, on why people find the taking quadrant the hardest? Like, yeah. Why is that? Well, like you said, it has to do with the shame and blame. And I feel like I'm a terrible person if I'm just feeling you up. And we have all this baggage about how not to do that. And... We also have experience in being touched in ways that we didn't want and Mm. that somebody really was taking from us and stealing from us and using us. And so that feels shitty. So why would we want more of that? Mm -hmm. So we have the inside the circle when there's consent and agreement and I'm feeling you up because I have asked and you've said yes, then it's fabulous. And if I'm just walking down the street or in a dance and groping you, that's not fabulous. That's awful. Or if there's assault or rape or something else, that's awful. So we are familiar with the dynamic without consent. And now we're learning to find the dynamic with consent. And it's a very different experience. And it's also hard in order for me to touch you with my hand in a way that feels good to me. Maybe I'm, you know, running my hand down your arm, for example. In order for me to enjoy the feel of your arm in my hand, my hand first has to be able to experience pleasure 
period. And that is not a given for everyone. Mm -hmm. So I actually start with an exercise called waking up the hands, which you can see on my website, which helps you to wake up the sensation in your hands and experience it as pleasurable by using just an object, not a person, so that you're taking the personal relational dynamic off the table temporarily. And you're just waking up your hands. What does it feel like? What does this pen feel like in my hand? What is this shell? What's this feather? What does it feel like in my hand? And then it'll sort of click and your hand will wake up and your hand becomes a source of pleasure to you. And then you can take that with you when you're feeling up a person. Because if your hand can't experience pleasure, you're not going to experience pleasure feeling a person because it just ain't there. Mm. And I think also taking is difficult because on a very fundamental neurological level, taking action for our own pleasure, holy shit, that's a big no-no for many of us. You know, we live in this Puritan culture and it's all messed up about that. Mm. It happens on a very fundamental neurological level. You're combining taking action with pleasure, and that doesn't combine easily for a lot of people. No, it certainly doesn't. It's really, really difficult to get people to go there. Yeah. And I just love the idea of waking up parts of the body. And, you know, I quite often give clients a sort of hands exercise to do where they examine one another's hands and wake them up. And yes. what's so interesting is that they look at the instruction and they say, well, this is boring. And I say, okay. You know, fine, fine. Okay. Mm. But <laughs> I have lost count now of how many people have found that that hands exercise, despite a sex ban, led to great sex, yes. unbelievable mm. sex. A absolutely. It's so, so sexy. Yeah. But people don't think of that. They've got their oh, real sex is penis in vagina. Right. Or whatever. Mm. And yeah. mm. um, I mean, it can certainly lead to that, but there's a lot of other stuff. Yes, absolutely. I think <laughs> yeah. the defining sex is penis and vagina. Is that the only kind that counts? Is a really uh, tragic loss of opportunity to play. So, so much. I yeah. always say, like to say to people, gosh, yeah. that's awfully old fashioned. And they were, they're, they're very surprised. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I think it was Meg John Barker who said to us, like, if your view of sex is so limited as well, that's boring because you're going to have way less sex than everybody else. That's right. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> if you expand your definition of sex, you're going to have loads. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Well, now I feel slightly guilty, Betty, because I was looking at your website earlier and I came across the video of waking up the hands with the pen. So I picked up a pen, closed my eyes and sat back in my chair and started doing it. And only after a few minutes did I open my eyes and look around the office and think, maybe I shouldn't be doing this here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had to do it myself, you know, like, but after a few minutes, you know, yeah. I was genuinely, it was great. Yeah. Like you just focus yeah. on your hand and what tickles or what feels nice. And you just learn to enjoy that. Exactly. And it made me think about the fact that like, I think for a lot of people, sex feels like a bit of a rush, mm. Like there's an end point and an end goal, which is yeah. often an orgasm or whatever. And the way to get there is to touch these specific body parts, the genitals. And then there's a rush that can become like a bit of a tick boxing exercise right we've done this now we move on to this now we do this mm -hmm. and every time it's a right. rush and every time follows a similar sort of pattern yeah this little exercise with a pen is an introduction into noticing other types of pleasure and it's great because obviously in this case with a pen it's not sexual pleasure the pen is just you know it just kind of tickles or the i don't know the plastic feels mm. nice against your skin yeah. or you're enjoying the little yeah. figure eight that you're doing mm. but it's finding your own enjoyment in it yeah. But what it does as well is it invites you to sit back and breathe and just listen to your body and think, hmm, this feels nice. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it just must feel yeah. nice, Betty, just being able to give people the gift uh, like you gave me in the office earlier. Yeah, you might want to watch where you uh, where you try this experiment. <laughs> <laughs> did anyone join in, Dix? Uh, no, no. But somebody did ask me why I was drooling. <laughs> <laughs> I think that one way that couples can apply the stuff they've learned from the Wheel of Consent to the bedroom is the three-minute game. Betty, can you explain to us what the three-minute game is? Sure. The three-minute game is a game that I learned in a workshop 25 years ago. And it was developed by a man named Harry Faddis. And the game is two people ask each other two questions. And then you 
based on those questions, you do whatever you agree to do. So the two questions are, what do you want me to do to you? And what do you want to do to me? Well, hell yeah, I can think of some fun <laughs> things to do there. And so I took that home from the workshop and I started using it with my clients because I thought, oh, that's going to kind of help me transition from the history taking, talking part of the session into the touch part of the session. And then later I narrowed it down for my particular use. And now I say, how do you want me to touch you for three minutes? Mm -hmm. And how do you want to touch me for three minutes? And of course, you can make it for more minutes than three, but three is a great place to start because when you're experiencing something wonderful that's being done to you just the way you asked, it can be easier to handle it for three minutes than it can be for 20 minutes or an hour. Mm. It may be too much for an hour, but you can metabolize quite a bit of enjoyment in three minutes. So it's a great, it's a great way to start. And of course, you can then extend it later. So I would use this with my clients. I would be asking them, how do you want me to touch you just for a few minutes to get started? And very often they would say, I don't know. No one's ever asked me that. Or I don't know. I'm always the giver. Or I don't know what I'm supposed to ask for. Or, well, you can such and such. Well, I could, but that's not what I asked. I asked what you wanted. Mm -hmm. So it turned out to be really hard for people, which kind of surprised me. And then, of course, I looked at my own life and I saw the places where it was hard for me, too. Mm -hmm. So there was that question. And then the other question, how do you want to touch me for three minutes, was where it was really hard because sometimes people couldn't even make sense of the question. I had one person that said, I don't understand the question. Wow. Like want to and touch didn't fit together in her brain. And often people would say, well, I'll do whatever you want. And I'd say, no, this is for your pleasure. And they'd say, but giving you pleasure is what gives me pleasure. And it just turned out to be really difficult for people. And so I gradually learned how to teach it. And what I found was that each of those four, what we're now calling quadrants, has a different way that it will challenge you and a different way that it's delightful, and a different thing to learn about it, and a different way that it can turn you on, potentially. And, you know, each of them is a very different experience, even though they may look similar. The three-minute game works so well, because when you ask your partner, how do you want me to touch you, and how do you want to touch me, you're giving with you touching them how they want, and then you're allowing with them touching you how they want. But then when the roles reverse and you ask the questions the other way, you're accepting as they touch you how you want to be touched and then taking when you touch them how you want. So the three-minute game gets all the quadrants of the Wheel of Consent in for each of you and you take it in turns. I think of the Wheel of Consent as a practice. You agree to step into the container of the practice and within that practice, you're very strict about asking exactly for what you want and only doing what was requested and nothing more and not getting creative and you have to say may I or will you or nothing happens and when you're in one quadrant you stay there for the three minutes you don't bounce around so it's a practice that can be challenging because feelings are going to come up when it's my turn to ask for what I want and I'm embarrassed or afraid to ask, or any number of all kinds of stuff comes up when it's our turn to ask for what we want, of course it does, mm -hmm. then it's going to be awkward. And that's okay. You're going to stay there and be awkward and you just be with each other with compassion and it's fine. Mm -hmm. And then when you're through, you close the container and you go back to your regular life. And then you play and communicate however you want to. What you learn in the practice then you take with you into your life. That's what I find the most useful as far as learning about yourself and really liberating yourself and each other. Can you just take it and use it as a just a fun game? Oh, hell yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. The great thing about it in the bedroom is that not only do you discover things about yourself, but you also discover all kinds of things to do that you hadn't thought of before. 
And I also recommend that you do it without including sexual touch for at least 20 times. Mm. Because for one thing, if you include sexual touch and or genital touch, your habits are so strong Mm. that it makes it very difficult to learn something new. Mm. Because Mm. you're touching this fancy body part and suddenly you're on on the program to get it to do the thing it's supposed to do. And then you have completely lost where you are. Yeah. So I recommend that you play it at least 20 times with your underwear on and no genital touch. The way it was explained to me before was like people sledging down a hill. Like if there's loads of people sledging down a hill, eventually people start to slide down the same routes because you go down it and the ones that are deeper and more in set, you just end up, you know, all of them start going down the same way. Yeah. So like doing it differently and the three minute game not making it straight to genitals and stuff yeah it's basically being like hey guys look there's another hill over there and you go and you play on that hill and, and it's all new and it's all like yeah this then is fresh whole... snow so there's not yeah, these grooves exactly. so it's like you, you just start sliding down it's all fun and new again yeah. and then by the time you do get back to the genitals it's snowed over again the yeah. grooves aren't so <laughs> right. the grooves aren't so entrenched but yeah. you also appreciate the other hills which you may not have done Definitely. before i mean that's yeah. that's what's mm. going to happen because mm. when you get to the genital touch phase of sex therapy so many people say oh do we have to stop touching one another first and you no no what if Funny question. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so weird. I mean, it's, it's true that if you don't tell people to kiss, they don't assume they can because sex therapy is pretty, I, mean, I suppose, you know, you're telling people what to do. And so you have yeah. to say, and you may kiss now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. But yeah, then people appreciate all kinds of touch and it's so important. And so, I mean, yeah. it's, what a great game. When you play the three minute game, you're saying, yes, this is what I'd like, but you're also setting your boundaries. Mm-hmm. And when you're in the taking quadrant, how good good you are at that is how good you stick within the other person's boundaries of what you agreed i think one of the words you used for good takers was integrity because it takes good integrity Mm -hmm. to Mm. like take what you want without overstepping the mark of what's been agreed Mm. yeah when i say you know may i feel your back and you say yes from the waist up only okay then i respect that if i'm trying to sneak over around the side or down to the butt and you know i'm trying to kind of see how what i can get away with that's no fun Mm. Mm. well it may be fun but it's not the point to the person who's allowing then they have to like oh my gosh is he gonna try this are they gonna try this and i you know what do i Mm. do if they go over the line whereas if you both have the skill to abide by the limit that's been set then Mm. you can relax Mm. And then you can enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think I think there's two things going on here. I think you have to be comfortable in yourself to speak up, but also you need to be comfortable with who you're with. Mm-hmm. Because there may be people who you don't know very well because it's like a one-night stand or whatever, or there's some sort of dy- power dynamic at play, like you're worried to yeah. tell them no or whatever. Yeah. Or, and probably most commonly, they're just your partner and you don't want to upset them. Mm. So that's what's so important about consent as well, is that you're comfortable in yourself, but also comfortable in who you're with. And I think that confidence comes largely from skill which comes from practice Mm. in which you get practice in the three minute game because in the three minute game built in is is a pause to notice what you want or what you're okay with and that pause is really really helpful when i say how do you want me to touch you and we pause and you check in with yourself and you notice Oh, what do I want? Well, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. What do I? Yeah, not. No, I don't want that. Oh, that's what I want. And it takes some time to go through that process. And then you ask for it, and you, you, and then the other person says, "Well, let's see. Is that something I'm willing to do? Mm, yeah, I'm willing to do that. Or, yeah, I'm willing to do this much of that. I'm I'm willing to rub your back with your shirt on, or I'm willing to rub your back but not your butt, for example." So you, mm. you say yes to this limit. Yeah, again, that example is really good that you said about someone asking someone else to massage their back and they agree and then the person is massaging is like, oh, I'm going to massage their bum. That's when they've slipped out of their quadrant. They've gone from giving, you know, giving a nice massage that the person wants to, to taking. And obviously what's terrible about it is that that's non-consensual taking. Mm. But this is what's so great about the wheel of consent is, again, is when you think about what you're doing or what's being done to you and what quadrant you're in, you sort of have 
you sort of know what role you're in. Mm-hmm. You know what your yes. role is. You know what your job is. And you don't need to stray yeah. from it. You're, yeah. If you're giving, you're doing what they ask for and how they want it done. And that's your job. And similarly, if you're taking, you're taking in the way that you both agreed on. And if either of you want to take it to a new level, you ask. Like, yeah. you start a new round. It's when you stray from your role that that's when things get messy. But people don't don't believe this, do they? I mean, so often you set a task for somebody and they think they are required to improve upon it, and so mm-hmm. they do. Their hand yeah. might slide oh, yes. down, and right, yeah, 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 and yeah. and yet you you know, no, an agreement is an agreement, and that yeah. that is yeah. a boundary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But try telling people that you know there is this <laughs> feeling that you should know and do a bit yeah. better. Yeah. yeah. When you say rub my arm, you have a movie in your head of how that looks, but the other person has a different movie Mm -hmm. about how that looks. Mm -hmm. So this is part of why it's helpful to play with it as a practice, because you need to get very, very specific. Mm. And also teaches people that they need to know what they want and to be able to ask because so many people believe their partner should mind read or should just know. Oh, yes. Yes, and, right. Because didn't they watch mm. the same movie I watched? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And also yeah. what feels good one minute may not feel good the next minute. Absolutely. And so it changes and that's okay. But I think people struggle with that, like you said before, Betty. So, well, well, the one is how to notice what you want is just to slow down. Mm-hmm. Also to start with things that are small, short, not so charged getting the coffee that you want Mm. or maybe having someone hold your hand or, you know, something that feels not terribly scary. Yeah. Mm. And as you start with something small and simple, you'll naturally expand. Do you know what as well, though, is I bet there will be people who listen to this and they love the idea of the wheel of consent and the three minute game and will think, how do I introduce this to my partner? That's a great question. Well, you can go to my website, bettymartin.org, and there's eight or 10 hours of free video on there that you Mm. can watch alone or together. And I'd say the important thing, if there's something that you want, the only thing to do with it that has integrity is to ask for it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn this new thing, then you can ask for it. You can say, hey, honey, I'm learning this new thing. I think it'll be really fun. Will you watch these videos with me? And they might say no. And you have to be okay with that. Mm. Watch them yourself. If you want to introduce the vocabulary of taking turns, which I highly mm. recommend, then I recommend that you start with making a request instead of an offer. So asking for what you want. Honey, will you rub my back for five minutes? And then I'll do whatever you want for five minutes. Or would you rub my feet for five minutes? Then I'll do something for you for five minutes. So, and they say, yes, they rub your feet. Then they say, oh, I don't need a turn. You say, oh, yes, you do. You get a turn. You get five minutes of my time right now, baby. Mm. You know, use me how you want me. So that you gradually just introduce the vocabulary of taking turns. And the reason I say start with a request is that, number one, it's more honest. And number two, you are being vulnerable first instead of asking them to be vulnerable. If you mm-hmm. come and say, okay, what would you like me to do for you for five minutes? They're going to say, uh-oh, what does she want back from me? What's she mm. got cooking? And, and they'd be right because mm. you're cooking up something that you haven't told them about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's, that's why I recommend start with a request Mm. And then taking turns will become gradually natural and you can build on that. Mm. And what would you suggest when people don't want to do something they've been asked to do? How how can they negotiate that you know, um, kindly, safely? Well, I think we have to really respect the other person's no. Mm. I mean, mm. no is a complete sentence. If mm-hmm. you say no, then I need to give it up. Good advice. No is a complete sentence. I love that. It's- I know. Isn't it wonderful? It's wonderful. Uh, um, Betty, you're wonderful. It's been absolutely brilliant to have you on. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. You are so welcome. Thanks. Wasn't that great? Brilliant. 
so wonderful, so amazing. And I mean, everybody I know who loves Betty that I've told I'm going to be speaking to Betty has been so jealous. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much to Dr. Betty Martin. Um, you can get her book, The Art of Receiving and Giving, at bettymartin.org, and the link will be in the show notes. So do go away and check that out because the conversation about consent doesn't end here. You know, we're going to keep talking about it in future episodes. We may even do future entire episodes like this one on it again. So there's so much more to learn and say. But mum, mm. as a sex therapist, your clients, do you ever use any of the stuff that we talked about? Uh, with Betty Martin, with them. Yes, absolutely. It's really useful. And we talked at the beginning about ways that consent opens up a sexual opportunity rather than closing it down, which is what people imagine. And one of the things that I quite often do really early on, or even not in necessarily in a sexual context sometimes, but talk to people about taking and how they do that, because that's a really tricky area. Mm. And it's often one of the first things that they go away and do. I mean, sometimes I have just said to people, link to the to Betty's website, mm. and they've come back really enthusiastic. And it's, and, you know, I've done nothing. They've just gone and looked at the website. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. just, uh, <laughs> it's just such a great resource. Yeah. Thank you so much for everyone for listening. Um, it feels great to be back, doesn't it, Mum? It feels fantastic. And we will have the mailbag back next time yes our mailbag will be open again next week so send in any sex or relationship questions you have for kate to podcasts at hatchick.com or by dming us on instagram at real sex ed pod if you enjoyed this conversation and want to learn more of course you can buy betty's book uh, go to her website bettymartin.org she has loads of great stuff on there that's totally free as well which obviously i love videos chapters of the book to read you name it she's got it it's great also check out our show notes because mum has very kindly put together a further reading list as well as her blog so check that out you know it is the real sex education there's got to be a further reading list you know and there will be a test uh, you know so <laughs> prepare for that but also i've compiled a list of my own which is a further watching and listening list for those of you who can't read or write like me and that's also in the show notes guys it's great to be back and we will be back next week so make sure you're subscribed to us wherever you're listening to this podcast so you don't miss next week's episode until then we'll see you next week for some more real sex education bye bye You've been listening to The Real Sex Education, which is hosted by Diggory Waite and Kate Gamble. The show is produced by Diggory Waite, and the executive producer is Andy Goddard. The Real Sex Education is a hat-trick podcast. This podcast is based on the real-life relationship between Diggory Waite and his mother, accredited sex therapist Kate Campbell. The show is therefore inspired by, but otherwise unrelated to, the TV show Sex Education. But yes, Diggory does wish his mother was played by Gillian Anderson. 